Hello listeners, I'm your speaker Casey, and welcome back to part two of Luna's story. If you haven't listened to part one, it is definitely worth going back and having a listen. As usual, a quick Patreon mention. You can support my podcast from as little as £1 a month, which will go towards enabling me to continue this podcast now my maternity leave has finished. Now let's get back to it. Did the pastor have any authority over what you would do with your spare time outside of the church? Yes, it was. um, I mean, I didn't have spare time outside of the church, to be honest with you. Yeah, but anything outside of like, life outside of church if he did control that for sure he um he, you know all, like i said all my poems and my songs he would he would have to approve them he would often make changes to them um and it was often based on like don't make the church look bad that was always the thing it was just make sure you don't make the church look bad um and uh you know one of the people i spoke with told me that they were being scrutinized for for getting a car that only sat two people. I mean, he was single, he didn't have a family. And so he thought, you know, economically he should get a two seater and uh, the leadership there, you know, is scrutinized and told him why, why would you get a two seater? Like, how are you supposed to bring people to church in it? So even his choice in cars was controlled, um, you know, anything, our relationships outside of how we hung out. In fact, one of the people I spoke with, I'll just read you this, you know, one of the things they told me. She said, I was soon propositioned from the pastor to go on an outing with one of the male leaders. Um, The guy was not my type and the outing was a disaster. Right. So Um, he's trying to play matchmaker at this point. Yeah. 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 For sure. He did definitely try to do that. And another one would say, uh, you know, he, you know, he told me about a time that he overheard someone mention that they were going to learn how to play the drums. And someone in the group with them spoke up and said, you know, did you check with the pastor first? Um, and so even the pastor, he would ask us for all of our social media passwords so that he would have oh, access wow. to that. Um, he told us how to format our emails. And actually, you know, what's funny is as I was emailing you, I, I created an email. Um, no way, because no way I'm going to let the foundation of me starting to speak up about this with my full name and then PTM at the end of it as formatted per the pastor's um, request. Of course. So I had to switch everything over to a new email because we were instructed to do this um, and so, you know, there were, he, he would tell the parents to bring their report cards um, to church. Um, you know, one of the other people that I spoke with, you know, she left the church and she was getting married soon after leaving the church. And she had a very close dear friend to her. And um, this friend decided not to come because she was still attending the church. And the leadership had told her not to talk to her or her fiance anymore and so she you know she ended up having a wedding without her friend there and to her side which is precious memories that she didn't get to have yeah yeah very sad and also similar to the again to the jehovah's witnesses in the way that if if you become disfellowshipped you know people that are still within the religion aren't allowed to talk to you anymore um Mm -hmm. so you're, you're basically completely excommunicated um which is sad for people you know that are having weddings or people that want to their their freedom but they want to you know be able to stay in touch with their family members who are still practicing um mm-hmm. so yeah it's 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 definitely sad when you hear of these these stories and yeah one one of the people i spoke with actually left the church because it was getting to be too much and her breaking point was the fact that the church would not allow her to speak with her brother her own brother um, and it was, you know, too heartbreaking for her to excommunicate her brother. And it started opening her eyes to many other things that were overly controlling. And she ended up leaving the church. Um, mm-hmm. So her brother was somebody who, who left the church. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. He ended up leaving, you know, and, uh, um, I didn't get to speak with him. Unfortunately, I did get to speak with, uh, 
who she ended up marrying, um, which is awesome uh, uh, because the, these, this couple in particular, I felt very close to as individuals because I didn't get to be around whenever they, they, they left. Um, and so he, um, it made me very happy because I couldn't think of a better combination for them to thinking of their individual uh, characters. Um, it made me really happy when I found out that they, they ended up getting married, but um, I'm trying to look for my notes here where I uh, wrote this part where he, she told me her story. Okay, so I'll tell you this one. So, so this girl, she would, she started off telling me that she, you know, many times would end up alone with the pastor and she felt very uneasy and she didn't know why, but you know, she ignored it. And um, the pastor would say that if he wasn't married and if they were around the same age, that he wouldn't waste any time, you know? And, uh, he would make time to talk to her after service about really nothing at all. Um, she started to feel romantically for another member who was a leader, which is the guy that we're talking about, um, who was brother. And uh, she asked the pastor's wife if they could meet up alone at a Starbucks. And the pastor showed up instead. Okay. Um, and so she just went ahead and told the pastor about her newfound feelings for this guy. And it says, to my surprise, the pastor was not only upset, he was angry with me. I didn't understand why. And I'll never forget his exact words. They were, you think you're good enough to be our first couple in this church? You think that I'd allow you and him to become PTM's first star couple? Well, you're sadly mistaken. No, sister, he's not God's will for your life. Um, and the rest of the conversation would leave me feeling lower than low. Wow. Okay. So not only is he saying that they, they can't be a couple within his congregation, he's also trying to suggest that it's not God's will for them to be together at all. Yeah, that was his way to manipulate us. I mean, he proceeded to tell her that she wasn't good enough. Um, and that she wasn't at his spiritual level and that she would ruin him spiritually. Um, later, she did find out that the same leader, the, you know, this, he was interested in her as well. And um, he did have a meeting with both the pastors, not just the pastor himself. It was the pastor and the pastor's wife. And their reaction was completely different. They were happy and they encouraged him to keep fasting and praying and things should fall into place. Um, Obviously, this pastor did that because his wife is around. Yeah, um, um, I, it's, it's very, I mean, it, if she reached out to the pastor's wife and the pastor showed up, it, it, that leads me to believe that she was communicating with her husband about the confidential things that people were coming to her to discuss. Oh, yeah. Many people, you know, told me. I, in fact, one of the people that I uh, interviewed or that I spoke with about this, you know, she was very distrustful of me. And so she's, you know, I told her like, send me voice messages. You can, me you know, can, you can message me as much as you want. She's very short answered, but she looked like she wanted to tell me. And so she's like, no, I need to FaceTime you. And I'm like, okay, well, I would like to record it because I don't want to tell your story wrong. Mm -hmm. And so lo and behold, I just, in the end, I, I agreed to just FaceTime her because she said, I, I just wanted to make sure that it was you. Oh, of course. Yeah. He would often use other members accounts. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, if he has the passwords to all of your social medias, then, yeah. then there would be that level of distrust. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I was like, Oh, my God, that makes so much sense. Because so many people ended up telling me, you know, I, I would try to talk to the pastor's wife, but this whole time I was talking to him. Okay. Um, and and did, was she aware of the abuse allegations against her husband? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, she tried to, I think the consistent story, 
Um, so yeah, the consistent story that I would get was, you know, she would constantly just throw a blind eye to it all. And she would, uh, accuse these women of seducing her, her husband. Um, and, uh, you know, many people would say that, you know, as long as she got her power, you know, again, there's a power play involved. Yeah. As long as she got her, her power, um, she was willing to turn a blind eye to what was happening. And so, um, you know, she would convince herself that no, nothing was wrong. This guy was also very manipulative and, um, you know, he would go on these tangents. I remember he would, you know, talk about brokenness. And when I tell you that he put on a show, he put on a show, this guy would cry and he always had bloodshot eyes for some reason. He was probably, uh, doing some, uh, recreational drugs. And so he, he would get very passionate. I mean, it was like those, those, uh, YouTube videos. I don't know if you ever looked these up, the motivational YouTube videos, the ones that are like, you are capable, you're, you know, you can do it. Achieve right, your goals. Yeah. He was very, very, uh, talented at speaking. He often told people that he didn't need the Holy spirit for him to, be able to inspire these people that at this point he was so good at it that he could do it all on his own and that he didn't need the Holy Spirit. So he was bigger than God at that point. Yeah. And he loved it. He loved it. He, he soaked right. that up and his wife, you know, also loved it. <laughs> also loved the attention and, and the power. Um, and, um, she, I think as long as she felt like she was, a very powerful woman of God revered by the rest of the church. She didn't That's, mind if her husband was going around sexually abusing other women. I mean, obviously I, I definitely think she minded for sure. So, which is why I think that she took more of the, more of the approach of like trying to convince herself it didn't happen yeah. and choosing to believe her husband when he would deny him um, these things and um, choosing to believe, you know, like the Jezebel spirit, which I'm sure you've heard of. I, I listened to one of your podcasts and you talked about the Jezebel spirit and, you know, choosing that the Jezebel spirit was all over. I mean, the pastor would go up and, and preach about the Jezebel spirit. Um, but the way that he would say it was wrong, it was wrong. The Jezebel spirit, it, that's not what it is. And he would say it like, oh, you know, men are always accused of being the ones that are going after these women, but it's really, you know, the women, you got to watch out for the women, you know? Oh gosh. Okay. And he would say this in front of his, I, he was putting the show on for his wife. I'm convinced of it. And his wife sat there and swallowed it because it mm -hmm. felt a lot less painful than to think that this man could be sleeping around with women and harassing them because that's a harder pill to swallow. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so it was easy for her to try to keep an eye. I mean, even other leaders that were approached about, you know, the, the people that were supposed to be keeping him accountable, they were told that, you know, he was behaving this way and they ended up, uh, they, these people chose not to tell the, his wife because they felt like she was such an anxious person that her heart literally physically could not take it and that she would probably die from the news. That's really interesting though. Do you think that that's something that he has, the pastor has decided to feed into the minds of the leaders? What do you mean by that? Like he has approached them and said, you know, you really can't talk to my wife about these things because she's too delicate. Uh, I don't think he, him, I didn't hear anybody that would say that. Um, I it's know. It's just interesting. As you tell the story, I could just imagine him just like in everyone's ears all the time. Yeah, no, he definitely manipulated it. I don't, re I don't recall anybody saying that specifically. What I do know is he manipulated people. Um, let me see. I have these notes from this one girl. So there was this one woman. I'll tell you this story. She was a, she's a mother and a, and, and a wife. And, you know, 
when they had first started establishing the church, she already knew him before he, you know, she knew him from back when he left the previous church. And so one time while they were alone, away from her husband, away from uh, the pastor's wife, uh, he told her that he wanted her to be his own personal assistant. And then later on, he approached, uh, you know, she ended up approaching the pastor as a member of the church because she was having marriage troubles. And so the pastor very quickly told her husband, you need to leave the house like now you need to leave now. Um, and you guys need to get a divorce. And he did that a lot. Many marriages, um, experience him trying to separate, you know, he created division, um, amongst families and, and, uh, marriages. And so the pastor left the house. He said he'd come back and he did. And, um, he started telling her to kind of sit next to him and his eyes were bloodshed, bloodshot red. Um, and, uh, he, he, she felt very uncomfortable. So she left to her bedroom at one point and, uh, he ended up sexually harassing her and groping her and very violently. Oh, that's, that's um, horrific. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, uh, horrible to hear from her. And he, after that, he became obsessed with her and he would harass her, call her over and over and over again. And he would pretend to be her friend, you know, to try to create a bond between them. And um, at one point he called her and told her that he had to tell his wife about what happened between them. And he made it sound like, you know, you and I are complicit in it. But, yeah. you know, the way he explained it was, you know, I, you mean what you did to me? Like, it wasn't like what we did. It was what you did to me. Yeah, it was not consensual. So, yeah, he said he wanted to confess uh, not only about what, them, but about other women. Um, so she later figured out that he never told his wife anything. But what was, what was in motion at that point was that instead of, you know, she just kept t telling him to not tell his wife. And so instead of letting things blow up on their own, um, she tried to call the pastor's wife herself and she called to apologize about it. And she took blame for what happened. And she was just kind of trying to do it before it got, got out of hand. And, um, she was manipulated to pretend that she was the guilty party right. in, in this. And so the, the time that she realized this was he approached her after she had done this and he kind of like fist bumped her. It was kind of like a, oh thank you for goodness, falling for it. No. So yeah. again, there's no accountability there for him at all. No, not at That's all. I mean, there was horrible. Supposedly there were people you know, there were people that were supposed to keep him accountable, but they were always really far away, like, you know, living miles and miles away. They wouldn't visit very often. They were kept in the dark about certain things. When they would find out, um, they would choose to keep it quiet. And like one of them, like I had said before, you know, it, they would choose not to tell his wife. So obviously his wife, you know, as far as this situation goes, she thinks that this girl, you know, seduced him and went after him. And her husband's just a victim of the Jezebel spirit that's infesting the church. And, you know, it's something that she's definitely willing to swallow for the sake of, of, yeah, of yeah. not having to believe the truth, you know? So is there any legal action circulating around these, these abuse allegations? At the moment, um, then I know of there isn't, and I hope there are some that I don't know of, but, mm -hmm. um, there was a point where there were over a dozen women banding together to try to, uh, hold this man legally accountable, Good. but his, his way of manipulating the situation was, you know, there wasn't a lot of evidence, you know, like, like, for example, this woman we just spoke about, he, 
uh, he later asked her for her password for her social media and then told her that, um, that he was protecting the church and he was protecting her yeah. and deleted and all of them. Again, it would be difficult if she was to approach law enforcement and then they spoke to the pastor's wife who said, well, actually she phoned me. Right. And she told me that she was the... It's a lot of he said, he, he said, yeah, she said. absolutely. Absolutely. It's very difficult. I, I mean, I'm glad the women are coming together and finally telling their stories and hopefully there will be some legal action at some point. Um, yeah. It's, it's incredible as well that you've managed to go and converse with so many ex members of the congregation who have stepped forward to, you know, have their re retelling of their experiences told as well. I know it's only a small platform that we have here to offer, but hopefully that will, bring some type of closure to to the other people yeah. that i'm not speaking to directly as well so it's yeah. amazing that you were had the forethought to go out and you know collect those details from from anybody and um, i sure. just curious were you ever successful in recruiting anybody into your congregation myself yeah um... or if not yourself personally what was there any propaganda or was there any kind of um, structure around bringing new people into the congregation? Yeah. So, I mean, I myself personally, I'm, I'm not a very social person. I, I'm actually enjoying quarantine. Um, and I know it's been months already and I'm still enjoying it. So I didn't like evangelizing. <laughs> that was not my strong suit. Um, but so, but I did do, I did follow instructions as far as other, as far as what we were supposed to be doing. Okay. Um, okay. You know, so the, the way that they would approach this with, you know, obviously they were going after young people and whatnot. And so they would do things like uh, special events. They had something called the nerd event where everybody got to dress like a nerd and um, they, they would do skits and everything was around the theme of being a nerd. And uh, they would do raps, which, by the way, the rap team, there was a rap team there. They had to sign over all of their rights to the music that they would write to to the pastor. Okay. So they had no rights to this music. But, you know, the rap team would rap and there would be, you know, break dancing and it was all, you know, very cool. So there was a lot of these like sort of evangelizing events that they would run. And there were like flyers that we would have. Um I remember feeling particularly uh, pressured to put the flyers on my profile picture. So it wasn't just like, a, you know, post it and say, hey, guys, you know, if you want to come, whatever, blah, blah, blah. It was like, you better have that as your profile picture, because if you don't, then you probably don't want to be part of this bad enough. Right. Um, we would do classic evangelism, which is sort of like the Jehovah Witnesses would. In fact, we would often run into Jehovah Witnesses and we were told to you know, that we better have our knowledge up to par because Jehovah Witnesses are notorious for knowing the Bible from mm -hmm. front to back, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, he had this thing where it was Mission 4000 and it was essentially, we wanted to plant 4,000 churches. And how could we even aspire to plant 4,000 churches if we don't even have enough people in our church? So we better get to it. Um, you know, never stop talking about it to your friends, your coworkers, your family. Um, we were told that social media was used as a tool to market. So use that tool. So we were encouraged to have social media, um, for the purpose of being able to market our events in, in the church itself, for sure. Okay. And was there any type of fundraising that went alongside this? Were you expected to donate any amount of money that you were earning at all? Yeah, I mean, there was indirect pressure in public. And he would say stuff like, you know, when he would collect the tithe, he would say stuff like, um, I don't expect you to tithe or to give an offering if you're just a visitor. But if you are a member, then it is your duty. Right. And I think this was part of his manipulation because, you know, if you want to be accepted as a member, accepted in this community, then you had to type if you consider yourself a member, but you know, if you were a visitor, I mean, you don't want to be a visitor, you know, you, you can only be there so long as a visitor. Um, and so I think that was definitely a way to manipulate people into giving and to staying. 
Um, and so there was a lot of direct pressure that I know of in person behind closed doors, asking people to donate. And I feel God said that you should give money or even people would feel inclined to say, you know, I feel God told me to give. In fact, you know, my parents gave, we had a little camera and again, we were low income. So we had a little camera. It wasn't the, the latest technology, but it was a, it was a useful camera that we use for our family pictures. Mm -hmm. And, uh, my mom felt inclined to give it because give it to the pastor because, you know, we needed to record and, and record, you know, announcements and just, you know, things for the church. And, um, not very long after they had that camera, he, he went up to the pulpit at one point and he would say, uh, you know, we need you to give because look at this janky little camera, you know, look at this piece of crap. And he would have my, my mom's camera out. Wow. So it's kind of indirectly doing the same as like a sit down almost. Yeah. Um, it really it's broke like, my mom's heart. yeah, like, d d d like shunning the, you know, the, the, the small yeah. things that you were able to give. Um, yeah. And, and he was like saying like, don't get me none of this crap. And I want one of those big cameras that they use in movies. And, you know, he would tell people, you know, when tax season came around, Lord have mercy, he would, you know, preach and preach and preach about finances. Yeah. Um, and, well, he sounds like the type of person that, you know, he deserves the best of everything. He deserves that big camera. Yeah. It's, it's his right to have that big camera. But it wasn't even him. The way he turned it around was, you know, we deserve the best. And so like, he even made us pay for our own chairs at one point. Wow. Okay. Um, and like, like my mom had to pay for like five chairs cause it was, we were a big family. Um, and so other things, I mean, regarding money, one of the people I spoke with actually told me about how he donated whenever we were trying to get that permanent building, he donated well over $1,600, but he received an email from the donation website that the record only showed that he only gave about $500. So where's the other money that he had donated yeah. so that was gone. Yeah. And then, you know, there was a, the website that collected these donations, um, had account holders that they were not aware they were account holders. We were talking about back in 2006 account holders, um, that, you know, like there was like different categories where it was, you know, there's a category for the children's ministry and the rap ministry, and then there's the church in general or whatever. And so each person had kind of like an account where they were running those accounts. And so the pastor might I add was actually a bank, uh, a banker, um, before he went into pastoring full time. Okay. So yeah, I remember during the first couple of years, he'd actually show up to our Wednesday services still wearing his bank uniform because okay. he still worked there. Um, so he knew how to, how to manipulate finances, how to commit fraud as he did. Um, and, uh, these people were not aware that they were account holders in this website. And so he, at one point, these people were account holders. So they ended up receiving emails saying that there was changes done to your account and they got kind of confused and they called the bank and they started asking like, what are you talking about? Like what account? And so they did a little bit of investigating and eventually they were removed. So they didn't get to know much, right, but right. you know, essentially the pastor had moved the money over to a main account and then he transferred it to his personal account. So and it's almost the same as still running the church but having the legal paperwork in somebody else's name he's still controlling the finances but it's different people's names on those accounts exactly and so he this website for people to donate to the church was open for a very long time after this church had dissipated so sadly you know it is definitely a possibility that many people donated with good intentions and it ended up in the hands of this man right right um, so yeah he committed fraud for sure and what about clothing policies or or restrictions on diet or, or anything like that was were, were there any guidelines or restrictions in place for your lifestyle yeah so i mean we were very much encouraged to come as we were you know come as you are and since we were we were ex-gang members and 
I remember there was a very sweet girl who I love and I still I still hope that I can get uh, reconnected with her. Um, she was a stripper and um, I, I loved her, her character and her vibes for sure. So I, I hope I get to see her again. But um, there were there were people that came from proper churches before, you know, like uh, my worship leader was uh, he, he sang very uh, like gospel music. You know, some people looked really nice, really like proper, like like you would in church. Some people would come straight after work and look pretty rough. And some people, uh, you know, look like straight up gang members with their underwear showing because they were sagging and long shirts and um, with snapback hats. And no one cared if you wore a hat inside the building. Um, it was very like, don't judge these people. And if you were to change your attire, your way of looking, it was because God was changing you from the inside out. Okay. Um, so it was based off of your own conviction, but it wasn't, we weren't pressured to do this. And I think it was because he didn't want to scare people off. Um, because you know, even the dress code was, you know, a big deal back then. So, but I do remember he would tell people, oh, you know, um, women he would emphasize women a lot um women don't don't be coming up in here all looking all crazy you know put your makeup on do your hair you know you gotta look good you're representing god you're representing us and so you know we were expected as women to look good and it grosses me out to think that you know he was doing it for himself you know y'all need to look good for me because essentially almost every single woman was harassed by this man so um yeah and in terms of the expression come as you are and encouraging people to just kind of you know present themselves as their true identities which is not something that you often see in a lot of christian churches you know a lot of the time it's um modesty um you know you're supposed to appreciate um the smaller things in life and not look for wealth and not go for riches and not wear anything too revealing and obviously it's it's generally quite patriarchal and the Christian church overall is very behind in things like the LGBTQIA community. Um, but it's my understanding that your congregation wasn't, wasn't strict and, and didn't have the same take on that community group that, that a lot of Christian churches do. Yeah, I think if he did, I don't think he'd be as successful um, because he was uh, aiming at a younger generation. Yeah. So he you know, if you, as far as like the LGBTQI community, um, he would obviously say that it was a sin. Um, but I remember, uh, specific particular members that I sensed were, uh, part of that community. And, uh, they, from what I could see, it, it wasn't anything that we would reject them for or even enthusiastically ask them to change that about themselves. Um, it was sort of kind of thrown under the rug, like, yes, it's a sin, but we're not going to talk about it because I don't want to scare you away. Okay. And, you know, even I would even go as far as saying, you know, you might invite more of your LGBTQI friends over here, you know, like yeah. as long as we get more people here, you know, I definitely do believe that the pastors were willing to turn a little bit of a blind eye to to this um to this community so uh you know and and obviously as history tells it these, these this community has been rejected by many religions and um they're not they're not accepted in society as much and so you know now they are more so but you know history says th that they weren't they're very much rejected and not accepted and whatnot and so I think that they were also very susceptible to falling into something like this because it was one of the very rare churches that were willing to not um, call it out as it is. Yeah, as especially, um, I mean, this is my understanding of coming from England as well. It, it, it's very difficult to find a community of acceptance within a place like Texas. Right. Oh yeah, Texas. Mm -hmm. So if you find, you know, as you're, if you're a young person and, you know, you identify, say you're um, a gay young man um, and you, you know, you, you 
want to practice your religion, you do believe in God, you want to read the Bible in a place of acceptance. If there's a youth church where you can surround yourself with other people your age that aren't going to discriminate or persecute you for your sexuality, then obviously you're going to go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So you, you spoke a lot about how your congregation peers were your family, your friends, you felt so close to them. You've obviously been able to reach out successfully and hear back from, from these people who have been willing to open up and speak to you. So I think that says a lot about the relationships that you had, but there was also that sense of spying on each other, telling on each other. H how do you form relationships and friendships, but still also go and snitch on each other if you do something wrong? <laughs> I uh, I don't know. I mean, it, honestly, I think it was like you wouldn't even you wouldn't even be allowed to get mad at your brother or sister for snitching on you because if you did, you know, you were doing something that obviously was wrong if she had to snitch on you or he. Um, and so instead of worrying about them snitching on you, you know, worry about yourself. Worry about what you did wrong. You know, for example, if I was seen talking to a boy at school and one of my church members went to the same school and saw me talking to this boy, um, you know, and she would go and tell the leadership and I would be upset with her for going and telling them, you know, well, why, why would you get angry at your brother and sister for keeping you accountable? She just saved your soul. Yeah. Um, and so how dare you? Like she was being a good friend to you by telling us about this. And why are you worried about the fact that she snitched on you when you need to be worrying about this boy you're talking to? Like you have bigger worries than this. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that we were conditioned to think that it was my brother or sister keeping me accountable was an act of love. Um, it, I, I suppose as well, it, it also makes sure that you are, um, you're focused more on your own actions and the potential of other people finding out or telling on you, which keeps you more worried about each other and yourself than it does about the practices being carried out by the leadership itself. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You mentioned before that the pastor would use his own examples on why not to do things. Um, and it seemed like almost as if he was reminiscing and enjoying retelling things that he had done in his past. Yeah, I don't I don't think he could help himself. Um, the narcissist in him could help himself. So he you know, we were always encouraged to talk about our testimony as it was called and then our testimony is essentially you know the story of our lives and what we were doing before the church what we you know before we got to this church and how we were saved and um essentially he would always be a great example at the fact that we had to share these things and so he would um, talk about his past and he would, you know, he was, this man was from Panama. So he would talk about how he was from Panama and the snakes were chasing him and he was a jungle kid and he's so cool. Like he was obviously talking himself up and then he uh, landed in America and all the women loved him. They would all play with his hair and um, he couldn't get enough of all these women that would uh, be all over him. And he, it was, it was annoying even. And uh, it was all kinds of women, you know, big women, skinny women, you know, and uh, two thirds of his story was this, you know, just reminiscing, you know, he was a, a, a gangster in the streets and uh, he, he was um, cold blooded and he carried guns and he was violent and he was, you know, strong and, um, he he would talk about smoking marijuana and the blunts and he would cover it in honey and they would burn so slowly and it was so nice um and man this guy was really really reminiscing his past you know i i and you know even one of the women i spoke with later she, she would go to the leadership meetings and uh she went and got his coffee one time and uh the lady at at the coffee shop said you know do you want me to make it how he usually gets it and she was like well how does how does he usually get it and 
it ended up having alcohol in it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. So, yeah. He was getting drunk during these leadership meetings. And, um, you know, so he, I mean, it's true. His, his eyes were bloodshot red. So for all I knew, he was high the entire time, but, um, he was very, very reminiscent of everything. And he had a nice little power trip talking about his past and reminiscing about these things. Mm. Um, and, himself feel good that way and we had no choice but sit there and listen because we were the congregation and he was a pastor and you know when he would use these examples of himself to on how not to live your life but almost sound like you know he enjoyed that that time in his life or, or those those memories he also restricted the literature that we, that you should and shouldn't read he would recommend Mm-hmm. the right types of literature to read. Is that right? Yeah. And so, I mean, everything as far as control goes, it wasn't like directly, you guys are not allowed to do this or do that. You know, it was all always very, because if you were that obvious and in your face about it, you know, many people would catch on to it, but this is a master manipulator here. So they would say it's better to read the books that are in the library that we have in our church because these books are guaranteed and approved by me and um in my wife and the you know you're guaranteed to have good quality books here and you're helping the economy of the church because you're purchasing it here and so so i thought you know i always come on if it sounds like a suggestion i take it as a suggestion and i always was one that was slightly rebellious so i went out of my way to go to a, a i remember because i went to a uh, bookstore with my mom and uh this book caught my attention and we ended up buying it i ended up reading it this book is called uh, captivating um by john and stacy eldridge beautiful book um since you are an advocate for women's rights and you are interested in these cults i i definitely i mean anybody hearing this i would (laughs) i love that book i've read it three times at this point um and it really it talks about women and uh in the church what what we mean and um what our purpose is and what we were meant for on this earth and uh it empowers women um, it doesn't tell us to, to, to submit and listen to our husbands. It tells us that we are powerful, that we are needed, that we, if it weren't for us, men, you know, men in general would, uh, wouldn't have made it, you know, we're life savers. Mm-hmm. We're not just little helpers. Cause there's this word called Ezer Genegdo and many people, you know, like to translate it as, um, you're, uh, a little helper, that's not really what it meant. It, it means you're a lifesaver, like you're essential, you are needed. And yeah. so it gives us a lot more power. And um, it didn't, it, it, I think at one point it contradicted the whole umbrella of first, it's the man of the house. And then under it was the wife. And then it was the kids. But the way that this book kind of depicted the family um, dynamic was that the wife and husband were partners, which is what I believe, um, equal partners that, you know, work together as a team to yeah. raise yeah. these children. And so I remember going up to my to my leader assigned to me. And I remember telling him, you know, I didn't necessarily tell him about the book right away. I told, because I kind of knew I wasn't supposed to be reading it. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And so I gave him some scripture. I don't remember exactly what scripture, but I gave him some scripture that, you know, talked about this dynamic because we were taught, you know, that men are, we submit to our husbands. And so it was a contradiction. And to me, the way she explained it in the book was, uh, it made sense. You know, I mean, it's logical sense. And she used the, the word in, in the Bible and she explained it and, and it makes sense to me. So I wanted clarity about it. And so, you know, he started asking me questions and he was like, well, where did you get that from? Where are you getting these ideas from? Who's telling you this? And I'm like, no, nobody. I, I read a book. And he's like, what book? Did you get it from our library? And I was like, um, no, I, I got it from a Christian uh, store. And he was like, okay, well, I'm not going to talk to you about it until you get, you know, you show me that book. And so I didn't get to speak to him anymore about it during that day. 
later next service, which probably was the next day, um, I brought the book with me and he like looked over it. He read the back and he flipped through the pages and I showed him the paragraph that talked about what, you know, I was questioning him about. And um, he kind of like, he was like, I shouldn't even be handing you this book back. Um, and I was like, no, it's my book. I paid for it. And he's like, he's like, I'm going to give it to you because it is your responsibility to get rid of it. And don't just throw it away because it might end up in someone else's hands and you don't want to do that to them. So you need to burn it. So we've spoken a little bit about the aspirations within the church to move up in, in leadership roles. And you were actually offered a leadership course at one point. Um, how did this come about and what was the, the course consisting of? Yeah. So this leadership, it was on Mondays and um, I had to get permission. I, I actually read the messages last night. I asked the pastor for permission to be able to attend these church, this church. I know he made me wait a while before he said yes. The way that this was set up was we would meet at a coffee shop that had a private meeting room and um, we would have a table to sit on. It felt very much like we had, like it was like a board meeting uh, because it was a table that we were surrounded by. And so it, we felt pretty important, you know, bought our coffee, although I was always broke myself, so I didn't always get anything, but we felt very important sitting there. And um, always had our notes, our Bible, like typical things we would carry would be our notes, our notebook where we would take notes, our Bible, and a book. Always, always had to be reading a book, educating yourself, the Bible, and your notes. And so um, we would have that out, and um, the teachings during these meetings were more towards leadership which, you know, a lot of the books were, had nothing to do with Christianity. It was all about leadership. Um, and they taught us how to be good leaders, how to inspire people um, in their lives, how to encourage people, um, what kind of attitude should we take to approach this as um, in a humility, in a humble way. And he would it was all very kind of technical and there were tools and these things are very useful. They're honestly, the things I learned in this, in this uh, course was very, very useful to me in my ROT, you know, compared with paired with my ROTC um, background. It was definitely something that came in use whenever I was, you know, I became a manager and, and I went up in my career Um I, but it was difficult to throw away in my head what was useless and what was part of the manipulation and the control tactics that they used and the actual knowledge of being a good leader. But, um, you know, that's essentially what we were. Also in these meetings, you know, they did discuss behavior of the members of the church more openly and, um, you know, it wasn't considered gossip because it was a meeting of, for, for uh, leaders. But um, as the group got a little bit bigger for leaders, it just became sort of another service, really. Um, and and it, uh, it was a really big deal if you did go to, go to these. I remember my mom telling me, like, she never got invited. She never got to go to a single meeting. But, you know, that's part of her being rejected in the sense of like, you're not young and this is a youth church. So right. go sit down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned night vigil vigils as well, and they went from sun up to sundown. So what did a night vigil consist of and how many hours is that? 12. <clears throat> wow. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it was something like from 6 PM to 6 AM or 7 PM to 7 AM, but it was 12 hours. And um, there was no preaching, essentially, although the pastor would sometimes go up there and kind of hype us up and cue in the motivational speaking uh, YouTube videos. And, uh, you know, we would essentially have the lights off and nothing but worship music playing. Um, and we had coffee. This is when coffee was introduced to me. And... Um, 
nothing but just prayer, praying. Um, he would often pace back and forth and pray. And um, he was, it was nothing but prayer, really. It was, it was a night vigil where we would just essentially pray. Sometimes we would be praying out loud in a group. So one person would be praying, um, which we called interceding. And um, sometimes we were individually praying. Sometimes we had the lights off. But at some point, we would all get so exhausted that we would leave the lights on to kind of try to keep us awake. Um, I remember I almost got into several car accidents, not myself because I was too young to drive, but the people that would drive me home would often get pretty close calls because we were so exhausted from a 12 hour shift of prayer that, um, I often almost didn't get in a car accident trying to go home. Yeah. 12 hours is a long time. And even as a teenager, I'm not surprised that you had to be introduced to coffee at that age. Yeah. <laughs> so- yeah. What age was it that you decided to leave and, and, and why? I, I didn't choose to leave. Um, okay. I, was, I was one of those people that just kind of got uh, plucked out of it and it was a good thing. And I didn't know it at the time. Um, basically, um, my, my parents were, um, having their own marriage troubles. And I definitely do believe that the pastor was involved in creating this division with my family because um, they're doing better than ever. And so the pastor was encouraging them to get divorced. And so my mom was the only reason why I think she was inclined to get a divorce was because of so much pressure from the pastor. And a part of her didn't want to create that division and hurt because she knew, she knew how much it hurt me that my parents weren't together. And so now there's my two other siblings involved. And so she decided to, she was considering, you know, trying to mend her marriage back up. Mm -hmm. And we had a friend, I want to call him angel because I think he was an angel. Um, And he, it's funny because he would go to these meetings. He was a big evangelist. He was very, very revered and loved by the pastor's wife and the pastor um, because he would bring people to church, a lot of people, like mm-hmm. by the group. And it was, he was charismatic. I mean, he's a, he's a car salesman now, so you can imagine he's good at what he does. And mm-hmm. so he brought a lot of people over. And so we were good friends <clears throat> with him. And, um, he would always say little things like, you know, these people are crazy and he wouldn't take notes during leadership meetings. And I would be like, why aren't you taking leadership notes? And they're going to tell you something. And he's like, no, they're not going to tell me anything. These people are crazy. They're always repeating themselves. And I would be like, what the heck? Why are you saying that? Like, that's, that's so wrong. Like you should get sat down for just saying that, you know? Um, and so he, he one day came back from visiting a church that he felt was super powerful. You know, he felt like God was, um, there, you know, he was manifesting in that church for sure. And, you know, he went up to my mom and told my mom that, that he wanted to take her to this church. And, you know, my mom would tell him, why would you, why did you even go? Like, did you ask for permission? Like, we're not supposed to do that. We got to ask for permission. So he knew how to get through to us. And so, he ended up speaking with the pastor of that other church and got me an opportunity because I sang and I wrote music, got me an opportunity to uh, go and perform at this church. And so that way we had a reason to ask for permission to go to the church. Um, So he gave us kind of an out and my mom, you know, he was like, okay, you know, the, the pastor said, you know, yeah, she's invited to go ahead and perform. So my mom was like, okay, well now that's a reason. So she reached out to the pastor's wife who went around in circles, didn't really want to give my mom and I permission to go to this church. But in the end, um, you know, she caved in because my mom was saying like, Hey, like we need to go and tell the other congregation. Like at this point, you know, I just, I really need an answer, please. And so she finally said, yeah, it's fine. Um, 
I remember we were told that we were not allowed to go on a Sunday because that was the, the main Sunday service. And um, we were we were instructed to go on a Friday. And so I went on a Friday night. I wrote my song. I performed it. They This church, particular church, had a channel on TV. And um, so I, I got to perform, whatnot. And so the, uh, we went that Friday night. We went Saturday because we did like this church a lot. We really felt like God was there and we felt... Um, we felt very different. The atmosphere was just, it wasn't even, the, it was not the people really. Um, it was really just, it was, it was almost like, oh my God, like other churches do exist where they do worship God mm -hmm. um, properly. And so we were very amazed by that. And so we went Saturday. Um, I think we even went Sunday before we went to our church. And so that was a big no, no. We agreed to go only on Friday. Um, we only agreed to go on Friday. And so we knew we probably would get in trouble for going more days than that. And so mm -hmm. we uh, went to church, whatever. Some people were whispering that they did, that they saw us on TV. Um, and, uh, you know, the way my mom recalls it was these people were sort of whispering it to us like, hey, I saw you on TV. Um, like they didn't want other leaders or the pastor to hear. Um, and so we during this week, this angel uh, would put in that idea of, you know, I think we should leave the church and I, sh I think we should go to this church now. And my mom was having to decide on her marriage on, you know, am I going to try to mend my marriage or not? And when she spoke to the pastor from the other church, this pastor was saying, you know, don't, uh, you know, he was encouraging them to mend their marriage. And it's okay if you guys don't live together, but, you know, at least go to the same church because you're trying to heal. And so this pastor was saying, I don't care if you go to my church or, or another church, but you guys need to heal. The thing was mm -hmm. that my stepdad wasn't welcome at my church. He was literally escorted out of church several times. Um, and they were very reluctant to let him in to watch my performances and my siblings' performances. And so we knew that it wasn't an option to, to go the route of PTM because my stepdad wasn't welcome there. And the pastor blatantly was just not okay with my mom getting back with him. And so, you know, mending that marriage. And so it was a very difficult decision for my mom. And um, I remember during that week, we went to a zoo at one point and all of us were there, um, including the angel, and we were discussing these things. And, you know, my mom is choosing to merge, you know, to mend her relationship. And, um, but now she has to pick what church. And we, I remember going back and forth with them and being the, the one person that was like, dude, guys, like just talking about this is like against the law. Like we're going to get sat down for months and I work so hard. I'm a leader now. Why would you, you know, why would you even consider leaving? Um, you know, this is horrible, like blasphemy, whatever. You know, I, I was really, really against it and I argued and I'm a, I'm good at debating. And so in the end, the only way I was on board with it was if we went to the pastor and asked him to pray with us, um, to see if it was appropriate for us to leave the church. Okay. And that was the agreed upon, uh, ending and so the next day we were very nervous it was the inauguration of the building that is now a dollar store and we went there and at the end of the service we approached him the pastor and my mom told him about her intentions of possibly and please pray with me about leaving the church and going to this other church because I want to mend my marriage. And he, I mean, he went from zero to a hundred. I mean, he got pissed off very quickly and very intensely. And he was like, you, you're doing what? 
what? I, tell me again. Are you serious? And he got very defensive very quickly. And, you know, he started um, spewing things like after everything I did for you. And, you know, he threw the whole fatherlessness at me, you know, like right. yeah. I did more for your daughter than, than her own fathers have ever done for her and he would like slam his little foot on the on the concrete of the church like I did this I did this for your daughter and you're gonna do this to me like you ruined my day and he was getting really really violent and so thankfully this angel was there and he stepped in between my mom and my my parents and and them and he kind of was willing to take on this pastor with no problem right and so things escalated we ended up kind of getting escorted out in a sense um i didn't get to say goodbye to anybody and uh i remember feeling so like no 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 like this wasn't supposed to happen like we were just supposed to talk about the possibility like he misunderstood like we didn't tell him right we didn't use the right words we didn't speak the right way we didn't approach him with enough humility um you know this wasn't supposed to happen like there's no way i don't want to go to the other church and um i messaged the pastor i asked him to please meet with me um he made it very difficult for him to like agree to meet with him. We met at a Starbucks and the leader, the leader, um, the pastor met with me with the deacon, which was his right hand man. Um, and I remember we were sitting outside of a Starbucks and the deacon had like his little computer out. I don't know if they were recording for all I know, they were recording the conversation, but essentially I didn't really get to talk much because I was there with the intention of going back to church. I was willing to leave my family. I was willing to tell the pastor like, okay, if you can find me somewhere that can take me in. I'll leave my family and I'll go get my stuff and I'll live with one of the members if they're willing to help me out and I'll keep going to your church. That was 1000% my intention. Um, but I couldn't get my words in. And I think that honestly, I think that was God working to protect me mm -hmm. and I couldn't get my words in. And the, and the, the pastor was telling me like, you know, after the same stuff, every, everything I did for you, you're never going to amount to what you're, to what you're meant to do. You're never right. going to meet your, your, uh, your destiny and your talent is wasted. What a tragedy, blah, blah, blah. You know, just putting me down. Um, and then in the end he was like, but I release you, I release you. And I will always be your spiritual father and you can never, you know, remove that because I will always be the person that brought you to, that brought you to God. And, and it, it sounds as though if, 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 it was your intention to stay with this congregation against all the odds, you know, leave your family behind to, to continue going to this church. It's not surprising that your mental health suffered when you, when you were finally free of, of this church. Yeah. And so, yeah, after that happened, I lost my mental health completely. I ended up in a, in a mental hospital for a couple of weeks because I was suicidal. There wasn't any point for me to be on this earth anymore. Um, and so I thankfully had one, one or two friends that from ROTC that I became very close with. And, um, again, again, I was a rule breaker, so I wasn't supposed to have these friends. Um, and, uh, I'm still friends with her and, uh, she, she helped me and she took me in with some counselors at school. I was a senior in high school, 18 years old in 2015. And, um, they followed their protocols and they took me to a hospital where I was admitted. I wasn't allowed to leave because I was suicidal and I spent about two weeks there. I remember when I got out, the next day was prom. I literally went oh, to prom wow. like the day after I left the mental hospital. It's and absolutely then, heartbreaking that you ended up in such a bad place from, from leaving a place that probably wasn't, good for you to begin yeah. with that's yeah. uh, it's so it's so tragic and, and heartbreaking how are you doing now with everything have you managed to heal in some way 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, even just talking about these things and digging and, and looking at it in the face. So yeah, like in the hospital, I was diagnosed with PTSD. Um, I remember looking at the doctor's face and it was very disturbed. And um, I didn't understand why he diagnosed with, with PTSD. Like, what are you talking about? Um, but I was instructed to continue to go to therapy afterwards. Um, and they were keep the hospital was keeping me accountable to make sure that I did have, like, I couldn't leave without telling them this is where I have a place to live. This yeah. is where the therapist that I'm going to see. And so, you know, they kept track of this. And so I ended up leaving altogether in I, the town and I, and I lived somewhere else. And, um, this year was a very diff- difficult one. Um, I could not speak about religion, period. I could not talk about God. I didn't claim to be a Christian. I, I didn't, the topic wasn't even uh, an option yeah, for me. I was going to ask about your relationship with God now. Yeah, um, my relationship with God, honestly, it's, it's, it's the best it's ever been. Because I don't know if you've ever heard of this movie called Lucy. Yes. Um, yeah. So you remember the ending, how she like literally just becomes everything. Yep. Yep. And when I, I, I by myself came to that realization that, you know, that is what God is. And so anything good, because the Bible says that anything good is God. And so everything good that ever is part of my life, it is God. And so if that is true, then PTM PTM wasn't involved in that in a sense like God is still here because there is good around me right and I evolved slowly into coming you know it was very very difficult just it was like a tangled mess in my head trying to remove the theologies and the teachings of obedience and submission and whatnot and just sort of pull that out of my brain and keep the good stuff which wasn't much from PTM but I did get to keep you know my belief in God yeah because when I did attend this church, I didn't love God or worship God or seek God because, because I wanted to, because I was desperate to get approval from this man. My feelings for God were genuine. And so he could never touch that. Um, and it's not true. Like it, it's not because of him that I found God. I would have found God anyways, I believe. And so, um, it took me many years, I'd say a good four or five years to fully heal and be able to talk as freely as I am now and look at it in the face and even feel this passion for, we got to help these other people leave. We, 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 we got to let people know what the red flags look like and the fact that these things are happening and they're happening now and they're happening to many people. And, um, you need to grow the courage to leave these places because your life does not end when you leave these places. It begins and it's Brilliant. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And that's great. That's great advice for anybody that's, you know, thinking about leaving their movement as well. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's like, it's such a beautiful thing. Don't get me wrong. I mean, like I said, I ended up in a mental hospital for God's sake. So it, it's pretty rough. You lose your family, you lose your, your friends. It's not an easy thing to do, but it is a very brave thing to do. And it is the right thing to do because mm-hmm. you can finally grow. These places are meant to keep you stagnant to, to where you cannot move forward in life. You don't have a career. Like you don't get to move out of the city because your church is there. You don't get to, you don't get to have a life outside of this church. And, and so many of us, each and every one of us has potential to do good in this world and to careers and families and, and experience love and friendship and different people, even different religions and, and different teachings and different um, morals that we can gain from these friendships with other people. And it's a beautiful world out here because the world is so, it's painted so ugly outside of the church. It's painted like it's, it's nothing but brimstone and fire and, and, um, pain and death out here. And it's not true. It's not true. Life is what you make it life. You control you, your, 
purpose. You have the reins on your purpose and not someone else, not a pastor, not your parents, not a friend. You, you have that control over your life and you are capable no matter how low you are in life, no matter how little things you own, how much money you have, it doesn't matter where you are. That's your starting point and you can move forward and go up from there. And that's definitely a possibility for anybody, especially if you're involved in, in a situation where you are in one of these churches fantastic yeah absolutely brilliantly well said it, i'm so glad that you've managed to find a, such a positive outlook and to be able to look back on on these things and and see the experiences for what they are but move forward with your mental health in such a positive way and it sounds like you've come on leaps and bounds from the awful experiences that you had around your deteriorating mental health so i'm really really glad that that you're in a better place now um i only have around 10 minutes left to talk so i just wanted to quickly go over my last few questions um before we finish today yeah. um one of them was going to be advice for people uh, which you've just given me in <laughs> such yeah. an eloquent way um so one of the things I wanted to ask is whether there were any other um, experiences that other ex-members had sent you that you wanted to share with me before we finish today. Yeah, so I think I'll go with this one. Hopefully I can fit in another one. So there is this one young and favorite rapper. Um, it's important to know this because even if you are favored by the pastor or the leader, you are still in line of abuse. Um, and so he didn't see what was wrong with the church until he he started trying to court like courtship. Um, and, uh, when I asked him about him being set down, he said that he didn't really have a problem with that. And he thinks it's because he did the music. He actually begged the pastor actually begged him to stay. Um, the pastor would refuse to agree to allow him and the girl he was interested in to court. He would say that he needed to counsel his, that partner. Um, if he ever, if they ever had issues and then he would send and ask for nudes and send vulgar sexual messages to her. Um, he ended up eloping, running away and getting married. Um, but then he tried coming back to the church because, you know, he said he was still kind of brainwashed. So as soon as he told the pastor that he had gotten married, the pastor snapped and assaulted him, slapping him across the face, saying that he was quote, going to make him make the church look bad. Months after the pastor slapped him, this member had a domestic violence issue with his own wife. And the pastor twisted this story to say that the reason the pastor slapped him was because of domestic violence issue, but this hadn't happened until way later. Um, later on in life through therapy, this member understood that the violence he experienced from the pastor as an authoritative figure was the root of his own violent tendencies. Um, so during this time, this member didn't did confront the pastor about his unwelcome sexual advances with his wife and the pastor put on several dramatic apologies where he cried and gave many excuses um he would say um that him and his wife don't sleep together um that his rough upbringing made it bigger temptation he would say that the that his, this member's wife was coming on to him he would also even have weird biblical theories about it not really being sex unless there's no condom um, the pastor would give this member things to do to keep him busy and away from his wife so that he could be free to harass his wife alone. Um, and uh, at one point, this member did try to tell the pastor's wife, but he later realized um, it was probably the pastor himself um, speaking to him. Uh, he ended up agreeing to pretend to be courting together, but the sexual advances did not stop and eventually left the church. So um, that horrible experience in the end just resulted in him leaving anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And then the pastor still begged him to stay because he was a very talented young man that attracted a lot of young people um, because he was a rapper. Um, but this man, you know, the pastor couldn't help himself with, with harassing, honestly. Um, another aspiring young woman. Do I have five minutes left? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. An aspiring young woman. Um, he would call her very late at night. He would ask her what she thought of him physically. 
he would tell he would tell her that he was a man first and that he had needs he said that he didn't need the holy spirit to convict people during preaching um when she when she did leave he called her over 20 times just over and over again um and when when he when she did answer he would escalate the conversation to try to get a reaction out of her she believes he enjoyed that um, he was very interest, interested in her sexual history and abnormally prompt at responding or expecting that response, which is something I just realized through my messages. He asked me about my sexual history as well. So for all I know, he was in the process of trying to groom me as well, although I was a minor throughout the entire time. Like right when I turned 18, I left. So um, yeah, there's one time she had a flat tire and uh, he instructed her not to get a ride, but she did anyways. And he got very angry and he demanded that she cancel her ride so he could pick her up himself. And, um, you know, the, this is just some of the harassment that these people received. And then the last one, an artistic and beautifully talented young woman. Um, he would sit outside her window in the middle of the night, tell her she needed to talk to him. He would follow her car and force her to pull over and isolate her in places. Oh my goodness. He would tell her that he's teaching her a lesson. Um, after, you know, he would say stuff like, after everything I've done for you, you can't even talk to me. You know, she would just cry and ask, she would ask him, just leave me alone. Um, and she even threatened to tell his wife, but he said that if he did, if she did tell his wife that people would fall away from the church and that would be her fault. And so when she did tell others, members of the church, they took it to the pastor and he would deny and they oh, would believe him. That's so, that's so horrible that she would build up the courage to tell people and they would just go straight to him yeah. and he would say it never happened anyway. Mm -hmm. But what's amazing is that she didn't stop there. She collected more women. She put these stories together and she kept going at it. And I do believe that this man is still going to pay for it. Amazing. Good for her. Good. Incredible. And yeah. what about you with your songwriting, with your poems and songs? Can you give us an example of anything you ever wrote? And is it something that you still do? I stopped writing after I, 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 uh, I stopped writing after I left the church. Um, I felt like I, uh, the format of writing was so drilled into my head that I couldn't write original things. I could only stay within the lane of what he taught me to write in. And so for many years, I, I didn't really write anything anymore. Um, I deleted all of the, all of that stuff because it hurt me to read it. Um, and only recently, I find it weird because like I told you, this entire experience was very healing for me. Um, there was a breaking point. I think it was a breakthrough for myself mentally to where I just started crying and laughing at the same time. It was very bizarre. And I realized that despite all of these horrible stories, we won. And so I I was very happy that, you know, I could see the ending to these stories and they were all very beautiful. And so ever since that day, that was probably like last week as I was preparing for this uh, podcast with you. Um, I keep just coming up with little hymns in my head. Like it's almost as if like I'm finally free and able to use my talent and I keep coming up with little songs here and there, you know, for like my dog, I have a puppy. So I sing him little songs about him being a good boy and I'll sing to my mom to tell her I love her randomly. And, you know, um, I feel the inspiration coming on that was very stagnant for many years. And so, um, I definitely feel that, um, you know, soon I might be able to freely, uh, share what I have to offer. Um, with with the public about you know the songs and music that i do write amazing that's such good news i'm so glad that you mm -hmm. feel like you have that creativity coming back because mm -hmm. creative practices are really important i think you know especially if people are studying hard or working hard um you know even if you have a job in in some kind of art platform it's impossible it, it, it's important to remember your own creativity and doing things that make you happy and hobbies and and things that just fill your heart with you know good feelings so i'm glad that you have some of that coming back back towards yeah. you now and my last question for you really is 
is there anything you think we've missed that, that we should cover before we say goodbye today? No, I mean, these stories are endless, but they're, um, I don't think that this is the, the last time that I, or even the members of this church will talk about this. And I'm very, very happy that we could bring this to light. Um, and I hope that this helps people out there. Um, and I'm very excited for the future because it's, it's never looked brighter. And I really, really hope, you know, the best for your podcast um, because you're doing good work here. Thank you so much, Luna. I, I think it's, um, I think it's so good that you've built up the courage to talk about it. I, um, again, I, the forethought to go out and collect stories from other people so that they could have the same cathartic experiences. Amazing. Um, I'm glad that you think it's, healing and I'm really looking forward to other people being able to listen to and relate to your story on this small little podcast and and to be able to say you I can have that same positive outlook I can have you know that same small flow of creativity come back to me and I I can have a relationship with God that is on my terms um Mm -hmm. Uh, which I think is absolutely fantastic. So thank you so much for your time today, Luna. I'm really looking forward to you being able to listen back to this episode and please do continue to talk about it and, and and carry on having such a lovely outlook on, on every day. Yes. Thank you very much for everything. I will speak to you soon, Luna. Take care. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. I managed to find a small segment online about this church. USAChurches.org has a small description about what to expect if you attend this church. Although no longer practising, and the Instagram page hasn't been updated since 2016, the segment says this. The place to be if you are lost in your circumstances where hope is found in our Lord Jesus Christ. Come visit a community of people making a difference in this world. It's time to be part of something bigger than yourself. Come be part of the PTM family. The return to and practice of biblical Christianity in the power of the Holy Spirit for the sake of God's kingdom and glory is our vision statement. The purpose of Present Truth Mission is to equip believers for the work of the ministry. We will do this locally by reaching our city with the gospel nationally and internationally by planting churches. This doesn't sound completely accurate compared to Luna's story, does it? This is the end of today's episode, but if you'd like to get in touch with any questions, you can do so at cultvaultpodcast at gmail.com or follow me on Twitter and Instagram at cultvaultpod. I'm your speaker Casey, and this has been the Cult Vault.